For instance, it has been found that about 63% of counselors, and I say counselors, uh, are not properly trained in mathematics. They don't understand, for instance, financial statements. They don't understand mathematics. Now, that's a huge problem. Uh, I would say you refer to legal qualifications. I would say we also have to look at financial qualifications in that sense then, because it's about the finances. It's about the taxpayer's money. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our world view. Today, we have a good friend back with us, Dr. Peter Grunewald. For his years of participating in the struggle, Peter sought refuge in Helen Ziller's house as an anti-apartheid activist. After the fall of apartheid, Peter was one of the founders of the Freights Room Plus, and he is today the leader of South Africa's fifth largest party. Peter, as always, thank you for your time and welcome to the show. Thank you, Donald. Uh, and it is also a privilege for me to participate. Peter, what is going on in Johannesburg? What is your reading of the situation? What was responsible for the fall of that coalition? I think we must just have the correct perspective when we talk about Johannesburg. And yes, we all know now that the coalition collapsed when the Patriotic Alliance uh, actually bro broke the ranks and a uh, motion of no confidence was then uh, stated uh, against the uh, speaker first. Well, no, not the speaker. It was uh, the speaker actually deserted. She was from Cope and she actually joined the other parties. And then they came with a motion of no confidence against the mayor. And of course, uh, they removed the coalition mayor. But the perspective on this is that we must remember right from the beginning that Johannesburg was actually a minority coalition government. I am on record where I said that we in the Freedom Front Plus don't participate in minority coalition governments simply because it's a high risk because then you are actually dependent on the majority and they can remove you at any stage. Now, what happened in Johannesburg also is that the mayor as well as the speaker and uh, the chair of chairs was actually voted in at the first uh, council meeting with uh, the support of the EFF. And only after that, there was a coalition formed by the coalition parties, which consists of, in the end, of nine political parties. Now, firstly, it's very, very difficult to keep a coalition very stable by means of nine participating political parties. So from the beginning, we must understand that actually we didn't have a majority. And it was a matter of time that happened what happened. And that is the background to Johannesburg. But I always say that, yes, we're looking at Johannesburg and the collapse of the coalition. And unfortunately, everybody thinks now that there is no future for coalitions in South Africa. But there are 38 other coalitions in South Africa, which is very stable. And yes, we know in the line is Erkuruleni, uh, will be the next uh, uh, metro that they will target. And in the end, they will try and target uh, Tswane as well. But again, I want to say that there are many other coalitions between uh, different political parties. Uh, for instance, in the Western Cape, uh, you have quite a number of coalition parties between the DA and the Freedom Front Plus, and they are quite stable. So we must not use one example and say because of one coalition government that collapsed, taking into account uh, the background as I stated, and now think 
that coalitions is not good for South Africa. Coalitions are here to stay, and that is the future in South Africa. And uh, Peter, um, what do you think is the EFF's long-term game here, the strategy? Why did they now decide to uh, vote out the Speaker and the Mayor of Johannesburg, and now they seek to vote out Ikuruleni's Mayor as well? I see it that uh, that's part of the strategy to actually show that they have certain powers, although they are not part of a government. I mean, it's very suitable for them to say, and actually they proved now that in Johannesburg, they have the final say and the final decision. When they decide to support certain um, councillors from certain political parties, then they won the seats. For instance, let's take the mayor again. Uh, they voted for the DA mayor, uh, Mpo Palazzi, and now they removed her again. Uh, that is a power play. That is how politics work. They know that on themselves they cannot form a coalition. And that's why they, on a strategic way, are trying to show the uh, electorate of South Africa, but they are still relevant. And um, it seems like they had a hand, a sort of a backroom deal hand in the fall of Johannesburg because they told the IFP, um, if you don't propose uh, your candidate as speaker, we're going to move against you in case it ends. Isn't there a story there as well? Just repeat that question again. So, so didn't the EFF threaten the IFP? Um, if you don't propose your candidate as speaker, we're going to remove your candidate, or we're going to move against you in case it ends in Kwasun at all. There was rumors about that. We're not very sure about it. But at one stage, there was a situation where, what, which was mentioned to myself, that uh, they spoke to uh, the top leaders in the Encarta Freedom Party. But in the end, it came to the fore that the full details were not disclosed and that there was some misunderstanding from the top leaders in the Encarta Freedom Party. Uh, and yes, they did threaten, uh, as far as I know, that if they do not comply, then they will destabilize some other coalition governments uh, and the e uh, IFP, for instance, in KZN. So that is the tactics of the EFF. And yes, there are many rumors and I was told about the threats. So uh, whether it is really in the end uh, correct, we don't know for certain. I, it's hurt, say, like they always say. Uh, but I do believe, if I look at the style of Julius Malema on the EFF, uh, I won't be surprised if uh, that really happened. But it doesn't say a lot about the backbone of the IFP if that were true. I mean, they should not have responded to those threats. Well, as I said, uh, it appears that uh, there was some misinformation in certain cases. So uh, it depends what was said to the leaders, uh, because it's very easy to create a misperception uh, of what the real situation is. For instance, if they don't uh, mention the correct numbers in the uh, possible coalition, uh, it is then easy to say, well, then uh, let's align with some other political party, and I refer to the IFP now. So, but that is politics. I must mention at this stage that the Freedom Front Plus also said, and I am on record, that we must remember that it doesn't mean, for instance, that say, let's take Tswane as an example, where we have certain coalition partners. Uh, let's take the DA, for instance. And we do not, will not be part of a coalition, for instance, where the ANC and the EFF is part of a coalition. But you can mention any other political party, but now it happens that in a certain uh, municipality or metro, uh, the DA goes into a coalition with a political party which does not been approved by the Freedom Front Plus then we will not come forward and say, well, you went into a coalition with a party which we not approve, and therefore we're going to withdraw, say, for instance, in 20. You must look at each coalition in a specific municipality, 
or Metro uh, for that uh, matter. And uh, you have to deal with each and every situation individually to see whether you're going to be part of a coalition or not. Peter, do you trust Gaten McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance? Well, it depends what you mean by trust. In politics, you never trust anyone. It's as simple as that. Uh, but if you mean uh, whether if they said that they will do certain things uh, and they will be loyal to uh, a coalition, uh, well, they've proved that they cannot be trusted because uh, they've changed. So it's not a matter of whether you trust them or not. Uh, it's a matter they have proved uh, that uh, you can never trust them uh, at one a municipality, for instance, or one coalition government, they will uh, go along and they will ensure that it is stable. But when it suits them, uh, they will change it. Uh, and that is politics. I once uh, dealt with certain or delivered a speech in Parliament in terms of certain financial legislation. Uh, Trevor Manuel was then the Minister for Finance. And uh, I opposed the, the legislation. And uh, he then asked me whether I trust him. And I said, well, you must remember, maybe I can trust you, but I don't know who's going to be the minister of you. So in politics, you can never trust anybody. Um, and yeah, it seems very strange to me, this argument that some make in support of the Patriotic Alliance, where they say, but he's playing this long-term strategic game by forming a coalition with the ANC. I mean, what long-term strategic game to the benefit of South Africans can there possibly be by forming a coalition with the ANC if the other alternative is a coalition of the DA, the Freds from Plus, COPE? So I don't, I don't see what is this uh, long-term game to the advantage of South Africans that Gayton McKenzie is playing. Yes, well, uh, Gaten McKenzie, as far as I'm concerned, in a certain sense, uh, is an op opportunist uh, in this uh, sense. Uh, he will go and lock, and he said that service delivery is uh, the prime uh, object uh, of his uh, party as such. The fact of the matter is, poor service delivery uh, and the poor services we experience in South Africa in most of the uh, municipalities is because of the ANC. And I mean, then we must also look into the element of corruption in the ANC. And therefore, I cannot see how Gaten McKenzie can argue to say it is in the best interest on the long term for South Africa, because it is not. Uh, the sooner we get uh, can I say, rid of the ANC go government, that will be in the best interest in South Africa, and not only on short term, but also on long term and in the future. Peter, sort of on a side note, um, is it, why is it Tswane? I mean, isn't it still Pretoria, or is that a controversial point? What, is it Pretoria, Tswane? Is Pretoria gone, forever gone? Now, you must remember when it uh, came to the names and the change of names, uh, in terms of municipalities, uh, like Pretoria is still Pretoria, but Pretoria is part of the metro of Tswane. Uh, Soshanguwe is still Soshanguwe, uh, and but they are part of the Tswane metro. Let me use an, another example where I live. You have the about uh, four towns. It's uh, the Clarkstorp, Orkney, Stilfontein, and Hartbeersfontein towns. They still have their names, but they all four are part of the Martlusana municipality. So to answer your question, it's still Pretoria. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Peter, uh, what is going on in Cederberg Ward 5? I mean, I recently saw Corne Mulder tweeting that the DA's arrogance is once again on full display because they purport that they are they did they won that ward. What what's going on there? Well, the detail in terms of that is that, and it's not the first time. All over the years, what the Freedom Front did when it came to uh, by elections on municipal level, 
we analyzed the results and we made our projections. And when we see that if we participate, there's a chance for the ANC to win, then we do not participate in that by-election. There are many of them uh, that took part uh, uh, in, uh, took place uh, in the past. So what happened in Sederberg is that we also made uh, the calculations and then we realized that if we're going to put forward a candidate, there was a big chance uh, that the PA uh, will then win that war and then the coalition uh, will collapse. And then we decided to say, okay, we will not put forward a candidate. And we actually said that the people, and we encouraged them to go and vote and to ensure that the coalition uh, stays in place. And that's actually what happened. Now, even if you go back to Matsikama at one stage, it was an earlier by-election that took place there, exactly the same happened. And then what the DA did, is they immediately start to claim fame that the people are now supporting the DA because they believe that is the strongest opposition party and they've misused the situation to create the impression that every voters now are actually leaving other political parties like the Freedom Front Plus to join the Democratic Alliance. But the fact is that if we did not uh, follow the route we did, then the coalition would have collapsed. And that is what Cornelia Mulder said, that that is the arrogance of the DA, that they do not recognize other coalition partners and the contribution they uh, did for the coalition as such. So because of our decisions in the Freedom Front Plus, the coalition is still governing in and do you um, is this to the advantage of the phrase from plus? I mean, if the DA keeps taking advantage of these situations, shouldn't you stop helping them? No, on the long term, it's not going to be in the interest of the Freedom Front Plus because uh, voters will start asking, but uh, well, you don't participating. Uh, why must we then vote for you if you want to participate? You always have that risk. But we felt that we are willing to take that risk. Uh, uh, in favor of the coalition, specifically in the circumstances of Johannesburg, where there is now a negative perception when it comes to coalitions. And we said in this specific coalition, let's show to the people that we can uh, stand together and we can ensure that there is a stable coalition. So we did this, but that doesn't mean that we are always going to do that uh, because the general electorate in that specific area then will have and create, have the idea then that they always have to vote for the DA. And that's part of the arrogance. Uh, and the DA knows that that will happen and they've misused the situation for their own benefit and not to the benefit of the coalition. Okay, there was a correction after the afterwards. Uh, Alan Ziller then... Uh, can I say, also tweeted and said, uh, well, they thank the Freedom Front Plus, and it was a combined effort. Uh, it was also, I think it's a Sederberg Right Payers Association. They were also part of that. So with great respect, the DA must learn that if there is a specific situation and circumstances, at least they must recognize the contribution of coalition partners. And I think that is part, if you go and look at coalition in general, uh, we still have a lot to learn, specifically when it comes to the Democratic Alliance, because their approach is that, well, if we uh, are the strongest partner in the coalition, we have the say. And that principle is wrong. The first principle in any coalition that is that the moment you're part of a coalition, you are equal partners. And when it comes to the distribution uh, or determination of which uh, political parties representatives is uh, going to be part of the executive, 
My approach is that the coalition partners must then decide who is the most suitable person for that specific position. Forget from which political party the person is. Let's look and ensure that we have the best people to ensure that we can start uh, service delivery to the benefit of the electorate. And that should be the approach. But the DA and some other political parties as well, they still have the approach to say, well, uh, I'm the, the coalition partners with the most uh, votes or whatever the case may be. And therefore I must have, for instance, the, fill the position of mayor. So I have a different approach on that. And um, what do you think can be done to strengthen coalition agreements? I think the Democratic Alliance has now come up with five proposals. I think Alan Zilla is behind these five proposals. I think one of them is that you can only have so many motions of no confidence because she gets frustrated that every time something goes wrong, there's a motion of no confidence. So what do you think can be done uh, on a structural, legal basis to help strengthen these coalitions? Uh, referring to some five proposals from the DA, I want to start with that. I think that is part of the problem also that I would have expected the DA to at least consult with other coalition partners because I'm going to put forward private uh, members' bills in parliament and all that sort of things. They did not consult with other coalition parties, and that is wrong. Uh, they should have consulted uh, to ensure that we as a uh, coalition uh, can come forward with the supporting of certain legislation. Your question to what we can do, in a certain sense, I agree with Alan Ziller on the number of motions of no confidence, but I go even further. I would have wanted to have an amendment to the municipal legislation to say that you cannot uh, put forward a motion of no confidence. Uh, and it's not, uh, can I say, it happens in the world, for instance, in Denmark, uh, councils are not allowed to put forward no, motions of no confidence. So if we change the legislation to say, when it comes to local government level, you cannot uh, put forward motions of uh, no confidence, then of course you will immediately have stabilization. Now the people can ask, now what will you do uh, for instance, if you have a mayor of a coalition and he or she does not do the work, well, then the coalition must act. Then the coalition can come forward and say, listen, within the coalition, you're not suitable to be the mayor anymore. And the coalition will put forward a new mayor. Then the coalition will remove the specific uh, councillor in that position. And, and, and practically, will... practically speaking, if he loses the confidence of his councillors, they will stop voting with him or her. And basically, a motion of no confidence de facto will take place. Yes, but, but I mean, it, you're not going to have uh, that voting within the council as such. Uh, then the coalition partners in themselves will take behind the scenes, if I can put it that way, will take that decision. And you must always remember then people saying, yes, and what happens if the person does not want to resign? You must remember that the legislation is also that the moment your membership is terminated by your political party, then you cannot be a council or a member of parliament. So it's not a matter that you have to go to council to have a vote of no confidence in, for instance, a mayor to be removed. If the coalition partners decide that the person must be removed and he or she does not want to vacate the position, then that specific political party must then terminate the membership of that person. And then according to legislation, the person cannot be the mayor anymore or even a councillor in the council. Um, and is there any other proposals that you'd want to adopt, amend, change that will help strengthen coalitions? Well, when it comes to coalitions, I personally think uh, that the, can I say, uh, before uh, the coalition moves into certain positions, 
that they must ensure that there is a proper agreement amongst them, see it as a sort of a contract. It's a, a, an agreement, a coalition agreement that must be very clear. And the coalition partners must stick to that. Uh, I hear that they want to propose certain legislation to say that that specific uh, agreement uh, in the coalition then must be part of legislation and cannot easily be changed. I think that will be diff difficult because uh, then every time you have an agreement, it must be part of legislation. I didn't see that proposals, but I think that will be a difficult route to go. It is a matter of we are still in a learning curve. And then I specifically refer to the political parties as such that we must learn that it is in the interest of the electorate if you form such a coalition, not in the interest of a political party. That is one of the benefits of a coalition, that the political leaders, and I've said that before, actually in a coalition, you require stronger political leaders in this sense that it's not only about their own political party, it is what is in the best interest of the electorate. And you have to be a strong leader to be able to ensure that and to also guide your political party that they can understand about what is in the best interest of the electorate. So that should be, can I say, the glue of integrity uh, amongst the coalition partners. But politics uh, is politics. So that's one. I know that there is a proposal also to have a threshold when it comes to uh, political parties uh, that uh, must have a specific percentage of support before they can be elected. I personally uh, is against that. And the reason is that if you look at the proportional electoral system, there is a threshold. Uh, but the threshold is very low, which I will agree. But then we must remember the more people vote, uh, the higher the threshold becomes. Uh, they want a threshold of, uh, for instance, 1%. And I also think that we must always remember in the proportional electoral system, even if your party which you voted for does not get any representative elected, the mere fact that you voted for your party has an effect to ensure that the governing party did not, did not get more representatives. So I think if you're going to make a threshold, uh, doesn't matter whether it's 1% or 2%, you're going to discourage some people and electorate to go and vote. And that will favor the governing party at this moment, the ANC. So I will be very careful with a threshold at this stage in South Africa, uh, because we must remember we are still a, a young democracy and we still have to develop. People does not understand the electoral system. People does not really understand the new democracy as such. Uh, and when I say that, we must remember that we are a constitutional democracy. If you listen what senior political party leaders, like for instance, even Zuma, Yes, we know who Zuma is, but still, they come forward some notions and said, but we must remember that we must look into the African tradition and African laws as such. And they always will, or some of them say that this constitution, the democracy, is not always suitable for South Africa. Uh, I mean, one candidate, Susulu, Minister Susulu, even she referred to uh, one station to say, but does the justice system recognize the real African situation in South Africa? And uh, so those, I don't say it's threats, those ideas are coming forward. But that is, to me, proof that not everyone understands constitutional democracy. And we have to ensure that our people understand them. Even if you look at the uh, illiteracy rate in South Africa, 
uh, there are still a lot of people who are still illiterate uh, and they won't understand certain things when it comes to voting and, for instance, the democracy. So we're a young democracy that still have to develop. So therefore, it's a long story, but I will be very cautious when it comes to a, a threshold at this moment. Yeah, perhaps we need more people with legal backgrounds and politics. I think, for example, in the United States, there's a lot more lawyers or people with a legal background that become politicians. But you don't really see that in South Africa. It's like the traditional BA politics or yeah, a BA degree, and that propels you to become relevant in politics. Well, that's an open debate. Uh, I always say in politics, uh, that will be, uh, can I say, uh, favorable to the people and uh, surely you will then be able to ensure that you have better debates when it comes to uh, the drafting of legislation. But I always say that you need people with common sense. Uh, common sense that, for instance, ensure that what is in the best interest of the electorate. But unfortunately, in South Africa, if we go and look, especially at local level, uh, local government level, for instance, it has been found that about 63% of councillors, and I say councillors, uh, are not properly trained in mathematics. They don't understand, for instance, financial statements. They don't understand mathematics. Now, that's a huge problem. Uh, I would say you refer to legal qualifications. I would say we also have to look at financial qualifications in that sense then, because it's about the finances, it's about the taxpayer's money uh, that must be dealt with. And if you have 63% of councillors who don't even understand mathematics, how can they then be councillors? And, and it may be sound if I uh, actually contradicting myself, then even common sense is not going to help you because you're not going to understand where the money must go and what the budget is and how you budget. So I do agree with you. If you have people with higher qualification, it's always to the benefit. But I wouldn't put that as, uh, can I say, uh, a requirement for someone to become a member of parliament or a councillor. Yeah, no, I definitely wouldn't be in favour as, as a requirement, just as a sort of a, okay. a bonus. But... Um, yes. But uh, Peter, isn't that a bit controversial to say the ANC lacks common sense? I mean, that, that's not true. I think they've got lost uh, common sense. And the reason I say that is uh, if you look at the corruption uh, that's taking place in the ANC and the government, uh, you need only common sense to understand that you're not supposed to spend the money and steal the money. Uh, it's as simple as that. And... Uh, they have lost uh, common sense as far as that is concerned. And they have also lost the moral compass. Uh, and that was set in Parliament before. Mm. Uh, they have lost it. It's as simple as that. And that's why I work very hard to ensure. And people say that, yes, if you say that you only work to work out the ANC, you don't have solutions for the future. You just want to get rid of the ANC. That's not true. Uh, we have the solutions. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but to implement those solutions, you have to get rid of the ANC. The first thing what should be done is to get rid of the ANC. Uh, and that's common sense. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just pulling your leg. Like Irma Mashaba, I don't shake people's hand, I pull their legs. Um, but Peter, aren't you and Corne Mulder getting a bit frustrated being the mediators between the Democratic Alliance and the Action Essay? Because Emma Shaba, uh, a week ago, he was on Worldview and he just spoke about, yeah, Peter Grunewald tried to organize a Zoom conference with John Stienhuisen and Corne Mulder. Try I mean, aren't you, the two of you getting frustrated with this marriage counseling? Well, it is frustrating in a certain sense, but. Uh, that is part of to being a politician. If we say, and I'm serious to say that I would like to see that they find each other, uh, let's take the two major players in that case, that's the DA and uh, the uh, 
Herman Mashaba's Action SA. Then, of course, firstly, you're not supposed to take sides because once you've taken sides, then, of course, you're not going to succeed. But sometimes, you know, when you're in a meeting with some other role players there, then political leaders, leaders sometimes train to show their muscles, if I can put it in simple terms. And yes, I am on record that I said that I will meet uh, and I'm trying to meet with uh, John Stianeisen, the leader of the DA, and Herman Mashaba as leader of the Action SA, but only the three of us. Let's sit around the table and let's have a talk. Uh, that's much better than, for instance, in a meeting with, say, 15 or 20 people. Uh, because everybody wants to say something, you have to listen to everyone. And I think the most important reason why I said that the three of us must come together is that uh, we as leaders must now come forward and lead and set an example for the other political parties. And it's not being arrogant to say that. It is because I think uh, between the three of us, if we can find each other and, and say that we are committed to certain matters and issues and will not, uh, for instance, start uh, communicating by means of the media, then I think that core will create stability within the coalition. And that's what I'm busy with. Uh, I'm still busy with that. <clears throat> it's just a matter to get a specific time place uh, and the date. So we continue, they both agreed and already said that they will participate in such a discussion, the three of us. So um, <clears throat> we will continue with that and see how it uh, progress. Good luck. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, and what if, I, I think Irma Shaba mentioned something along the lines of because um, they are now talking to the ANC. I don't know if that's true or not, that Action SA is talking to the ANC. But because they're doing that, John Stenhausen does not want to be part of this meeting anymore. He says, because uh, your, your party is now talking to the ANC, we don't want to meet with you anymore. Well, uh, if they say, I, I, I'm not aware of the fact that they will not meet with me and Darman Mashaba anymore. Um, in fact, they have questions. Well, Erman Mashaba has explained the matter about talking to the ANC. Uh, he also said that uh, he will never go into a coalition. I think sometimes we must well, also understand politics and say to each other that uh, you must understand the context. I mean, the DA also talks to the other political parties, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have talks about forming a coalition. We must always be clear and clear-minded what is the talks about. Uh, and let me give you an example. Uh, the expropriation bill in the National Assembly has been accepted, it, uh, <clears throat> sorry, has referred to the National Council of Provinces. But Section 80 of the Constitution determines that if a third of members of the National Assembly request so, that when the president has signed the bill, must be referred to the constitutional court, it must be done. So at this moment, I'm also busy with a process trying to get a third of the members of the National Assembly to put such a request in terms of Section 80 of the Constitution. But that means that I will have to talk to the EFF. But they vote for completely different reasons against the expropriation bill. But the fact of the matter is, it happens quite often in Parliament that all the opposition parties vote against a specific motion uh, or against a specific uh, bill. But that doesn't mean that all the Opposition parties are now in a coalition. So people must distinguish between that. And I use this example to say that uh, we must firstly ask ourselves, if we say we talk to other political parties, 
what are we talking about is the main issue. Uh, if I now said, I said that I will have to talk to the EFF. Now, if people say, no, but Grunewald is speaking to the EFF, it's very easy to say, oh, well, he said he will never go into a coalition with the EFF. Of course, I, we will never go into a coalition with the EFF, but we must understand what we want to talk about. Uh, so that is a very important, uh, can I say, way uh, to ensure that you talk about the right things. How worried should we be about this new bill that was passed, this new expropriation um, bill? How much or what? How much wor how worried should we be about this new no, bill? That was, yeah. Well, I am very worried about it because we must remember that expropriation without compensation, if this bill goes through, uh, we must not underestimate the ANC government. For instance, they will come forward and they will expropriation state land. They've already said it. They will expropriation state land without compensation. Now that's absurd. Uh, how can the government expropriate its own property? But people don't understand it. Coming back to what people understand. And then people will start getting used to it. And then in the end, it will just become more and more to the fore where they will misuse their powers to expropriate without compensation. That's actually what also happened in Zimbabwe. We must remember that if you look at the land reform in Zimbabwe, Mugabe actually used quite a number of pieces of legislation, uh, which was still determined by Ian Smith. And he used that, misinterpreted it, and went forward with his land grab in Zimbabwe. And we can go into the details of uh, the expropriation bill, but for instance, and that's why we say we are going to the uh, constitutional court, because to say it's of uh, the compensation is no, I mean, what's the difference between to say it's uh, no, but it's without compensation? It's just exactly the same name. It's the uh, same thing, it's just a different name. Therefore, we say section 25 of the constitution is very clear uh, that it must be fair and just, the compensation. And we must remember, uh, earlier this uh, year, uh, the ANC lost uh, the amendment of section 25 of the constitution because they didn't get a two-thirds majority. And I see this expropriation bill, nothing else, as another way to sort of try to go and see if we can follow this route to ensure that we can still have expropriation without compensation. Let's just call it, it's a null compensation. And then we have some preconditions before you can do it. But one precondition of that, for instance, in the bowl at this moment, uh, determines if you have land, it's there, it's not used, uh, uh, and you don't, for instance, produce on the piece of land, then it can be used and be expropriated without compensation. The fact of the matter is, and everybody thinks it's about farms, it's not only about farms. If you, for instance, uh, if you are a property speculant and you are doing your businesses with uh, the buying and the selling of land, you will get many pieces of land, specifically in cities and in towns, where people have, for instance, a site there, uh, they've got nothing on it, but then they sell it again uh, with a profit, and that's part of the business. Now, in this specific case, in terms of this expropriation bill, that will mean that the government can come forward and say, well, you didn't, for instance, put up a house in that specific piece uh, of site. So we're now going to expropriate it without compensation because we want to use it for the housing problem when it comes to cities and towns. And therefore, I am very worried about it. And we must also remember, when we talk about expropriation, 
Yes, they always want to tell you about expropriation is all over the world. It's true. But all over the you uh, all, uh, all over the world, when you talk about expropriation, it is expropriation for public use, meaning that if the government wants to build a road or a railway or build a bridge or everything and they need a land, then they can go to the owner and expropriation, not without compensation, with compensation. But then it cannot refuse, uh, the owner cannot refuse because it is for public purpose, uh, for public use. But in this expropriation bill, they add another qualification that is for public interest. Now, public interest, they specifically re refer to land reform. And that means that they can be expropriated without compensation to enhance land reform in South Africa. And I wanted to put it very clearly. Land is not a problem in South Africa when it comes to land reform. We can go through the whole process in terms of land reform. Uh, if we like, look, for instance, at the restitution of uh, land claims, 93% of the claimants wanted the money, not the land. And that is part of the annual reports of the Department of Land and Agriculture. It's not figures given by some other institutions, the government itself. There's more than enough land. They normally use it as an excuse to say, but there's not enough land. For instance, uh, we have an urbanization at the moment. People are moving to the cities. The fact of the matter is, if the metros or the municipalities, if they are doing their work properly, they have a planning department. Each and every municipality or council has a planning department. And if they do the planning properly, they will identify land in time. They will ensure that the basic services are there. And then they can say to the people, come in. Then we won't have the problems we have. So if they do their job, I am quite clear on that. Land is not a problem when it comes to land reform in South Africa. And Peter, what do you expect will happen in 2024, the election 2024? What does the Freedom Front Plus hope to get? And do you see the ANC falling below 50%? Because recent polling suggests that they might uh, cling on to power. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, in politics, uh... It's always a matter of speculation. There's only one true result, and that is uh, the election itself. I personally believe that they will get below 50%. Um, if they get more than 50%, then I think that all the opposition parties must ask themselves, what did they do uh, or what did they not do to ensure that the ANC gets uh, uh, below 50%? Uh, Having said that, what I say is that opposition parties must work hard to ensure that the ANC gets below 50%. It is quite possible. And that's why I say we also need a political party, uh, for instance, that can get the voters from the ANC to get away from the ANC and to go and vote. I know the Freedom Front Plus. We're not in a position to say to the ANC supporters, but rather vote for the Freedom Front Plus. But you have the Democratic Alliance and you have Action SA and other political parties, the Encarta Freedom Party. They must work hard and they must focus on the supporters of the ANC to say that we are an alternative. So if they work hard, and I still believe and I do believe that the ANC will get below 50%. Of course, then there are different scenarios. Uh, it, let's say, for instance, the ANC get 45%. Then, firstly, the ANC can decide that they go into a coalition for, with the Inkata Freedom Party. The Freedom, Inkata Freedom Party must decide. That will maybe give them more than 50%. They can go into a coalition with the EFF. I personally think it depends whether Silver Ramaphosa is going to be re-elected by December month, uh, December uh, when they have the uh, Congress. And if Cyril is re-elected, I think that the chances of a coalition with the EFF is less 
because there is not good relations between Cyril Ramaphosa and the EFF. But it can also happen that in the election of Cyril that he has some people in senior positions that is in favor of the EFF, which he will have to deal with. So those are the scenarios, it's true. But I hope that we can get the situation where opposition parties can get enough votes to form a coalition government. Uh, that is possible if we all work hard. And then, for instance, the ANC can also come and say that they want to go into a coalition with the Democratic Alliance. Now, it is on record that John Steenhuisen, for instance, said that if they get rid of the, like they call it, the bad guys uh, in the ANC, uh, then they will reconsider and will maybe become part of such a coalition. Uh, that's on record. Even Alan Ziller uh, suggested that if uh, they get rid of the corrupt in the ANC, they can uh, reconsider. So that's a possibility. But it's for the DA then to determine that. The other scenario, of course, is also that Cyril can come forward <clears throat> and establish a government of national unity, more or less similar to 1994, uh, where he gets some other political parties, make them part of the executive, and then form a government of national unity. So there are very various scenarios that can happen. If you ask what I would like to have, I would want us to work very hard as opposition parties to ensure that we as opposition parties can form a coalition government. I want to say it very clearly, and that's only possible if there's a partnership with the electorate. And when I say a partnership, I want to say that political parties are only as strong as the voters make their parties. And we must remember at this moment, the ANC is governing with a 58% majority in the National Assembly, but they only have 27% support of eligible voters in South Africa. So the electorate, and that's what I mean by a partnership, they must ensure that they go and register and that they go and vote in the 2024 election. Because if they're not going to vote, they're going to make the ANC stronger. And therefore, I say there's a partnership that must be formed amongst the opposition parties on the one side and the voters on the other side. And we'll have to take hands to outvote the ANC because another five years under the ANC is going to make it more difficult that in the, at the moment uh, with an ANC government. Peter, um... Does Rob Herschel fund the Fries from Plus? No, we don't receive any and haven't received any uh, uh, donations from him. Um, we must remember that in terms of uh, new legislation, the Party Political Fund uh, uh, Act, that you have to declare any uh, amount of 100,000 rand and more that you received from a donor. Now, I also get some inquiries by people and said, well, only a few political parties declared their income uh, and their donations. But what they don't understand, the Freedom Front Plus is not there because we didn't receive a donation more than 100,000 Rand. But still, even if you get 10 Rand donation, you have to declare it to the Electoral Commission. And we do that. Uh, so all those donations are declared. But because it's not more than 100,000 Rand, it's not been made public in terms of the act. So I can categorically say uh, no, uh, but I also want to say, I will appreciate if he wants to make a donation to the Freedom Front Plus. Uh, I have no problem with that. Um, Peter, um, I've interviewed Professor, I don't know if you know him, Professor R.W. Johnson. And he yes. says that, um, it would be a disaster for the Democratic Alliance or any minority opposition party to form a coalition with the ANC nationally 
whether it's via a government of national unity or any other method, because the ANC will outfox you. They have years of experience leading South Africa, and they will find ways to still be corrupt and pull you down with them. That's, it's the last thing you should do as form a coalition with the ANC or a government of national unity. What do you think of that? I agree with R. W. Johnson as far as that is concerned. Uh, because you must remember, and as he said, they have years of experience. And let's take a government of national unity. We must remember that uh, F. W. de Klerk then in 97, uh, it means less than four years after the national government of, of the uh, national government of unity was established, he withdrawn from that government. And he said, well, he is withdrawing because everything is manipulated by the ANC. And he actually felt that he is of no use in such a uh, government. And that's why they've withdrawn. I personally think at that stage, maybe they should have tried to stay longer. And the reason I say that is because we must remember that at that stage, Nelson Mandela was the president. The corruption was not that pandemic at that stage. So maybe he should have tried to stay longer. But again, if you take the ANC today, <clears throat> you will become part of the corruption because it is corrupted into the core. And therefore, I quite agree. And that's why I'm also on record that I said that we will not become part of such a coalition uh, because you will only be, in the end, an useful idiot. And uh, that is not to the benefit of South Africa. It will only be to the benefit of the ANC. And we must also remember corruption <clears throat> is of such pandemic uh, situation that it's not a can I say an instant solution? It will take years to sort that out. And that's why, for instance, the Freedom Front Plus with the local government election, our poster said, stop the decay. So the first thing when you become the government, even as a coalition, opposition coalition government, you will first have to stop the decay. And then you will have to start to clean up the system. And that will take years. It's not an instant solution to say within a year, everything will be well. It will be, take really years because we must also remember that the government departments, the cadre deployment within those departments where the corruption is, is not just to say you are one, that one in that one and then get rid of them. You will have to prove it. It will be a process to clean up the whole government system to get rid of corruption. And of course, we know <clears throat> you will never completely get rid of corruption. I mean, governments all over the world have corruption uh, amongst themselves. But the fact of the matter is we must stop it and we must get people with integrity to ensure that they fight that. And if people are exposed and part of corruption, then they must pay the price. Because I've said it many times, one of the big problems also in South Africa is impunity. People just get away with crime. And that those steps will have to be taken by a new coalition government. And if you're part of the ANC, you can forget it. Peter, um, you were on the show that um, Salim Wing hosted where... Um, Herman Mashaba was part of the panel, Musi Maimani was part of the panel, and Bantu Olamisa, the, the, I think it was the, the four of you, um, and Salim Wing hosted the show, and the discussion was surrounding the idea of a UDF 2.0 uh, needed to fight the ANC, and I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you like the idea of a, a sort of an umbrella organization that helps the coalition parties get together with a strategy to fight the ANC. Are you still in favor of that idea? Well, we must look into the detail. I am in favor of, and I want to call it more a UDF movement. When I mean a movement, it's not an umbrella organization 
where all political parties are actually um, affiliated to. Uh, that, that will not be a, a solution. But there should be a UDF movement to be started in South Africa where the movement says, irrespective of which political party you are, we are in such deep trouble and the circumstances are so bad under the ANC government, let's take hands and convince people to vote for other political parties and not the ANC. To use another example, when Zuma was still the president, there was also a strong movement at one stage, uh, for instance, for motions of no confidence against Zuma. And it was different political parties. I actually shared uh, a stand with Julius Malema uh, to say, let's get away or get rid of Jacob Zuma. So when I talk about the UDF movement, because that we must also understand, if you go back uh, to the early like the 80s, early 90s, the UDF as uh, such was a movement. It was not an ANC. The ANC and all those parties were not actually affiliated to them. They participated in that movement. And that's what we need in South Africa to get the voters away from the ANC that they can understand. There are alternatives, other political parties who really wants to act in your best interest. So in that sense, I do support the UDF movement. And Peter, how would you handle the big egos in politics? For example, let's take a hypothetical scenario. I mean, this is hypothetical. Let's say there's a leader of Action SA that's very emotional, stubborn. This, this is hypothetical, right? This is not real life. Let's say you need to get that person in a room. How, how would you... How would you do it. I mean, how would you, for example, get the big egos of the DA in a room, action essay? How would you handle such meetings? Uh, you're asking the questions what is going to take place in the inner circle at, at in the end of those discussions. Well, firstly, you recognize the qualities of each and every leader. That is the most important thing. Each and every political party has certain qualities. Uh, good qualities. And I always say, let's focus on those good qualities. Uh, there's some notion that says horses for courses. So yes, uh, you have political leaders will be best at a specific issue and let them do that. Uh, that is how it should be. And it comes actually back to what I said in the beginning, that if you're a coalition, get the best person to do the job. So Yes, there are egos, because you must remember, uh, each and every politician has certain aspirations. Uh, they, that's why they are there. I say each and every public representative, whether it's a councillor or a member of parliament or a provincial legislature, has certain leadership qualities in him or her, or else they wouldn't have been there. Um, and therefore, I always say, recognize that, respect them for that. And that's my way of seeing how we can go forward. And I want to put the word respect in the center of that. Uh, I always say that, you know, if we have respect, South Africa will become a really wonderful place. Because if you have respect for yourself, you will have respect for other people. You will not kill them for their cell phone. You will have respect for our differences. So that is most important. And I would try to say to all leaders, not only to some leaders, let's say to each other that we respect each other and we respect our differences. But part of the problem, if I come back to that, and I've said that uh, publicly already, one of the problems when it comes to the Action SA and the Democratic Alliance, and I said I do understand that because you must remember, actually most of the senior leaders in the Action SA were actually previous leaders in the Democratic Alliance. And I know in a political party, if you have some members and they're breaking away, uh, like they always say, then there's real bad blood. And it's not as simple as, 
okay, let's forget and just continue. You will always have that bad blood. But that's why I then say, let's bring in respect. Okay, you were part, you're not anymore. I respect your decisions. Uh, and I always say, I, for instance, had some people, they say, we like what you say and we like the party, but we differ on this. Uh, I had a case, for instance, where a person said everything very nice, but I'm not a Christian and I do not believe in Christian principles. And I was honest then, and I said, I respect your view, but please also respect my view and don't expect from me to change the founding principles of the Freedom Front Plus to do away with the Christian principles. Let's have respect for each other. And we had a very good discussion and we left each other with mutual respect to each other. So it's a simple matter, but I do believe if we have that approach, then we will create a better South Africa. And I do believe that if we stick to that respect and all the facets of different ways of uh, applying that, that uh, we will have success. Peter, my last question is, I see we're running out of time. My last question is, who is the leader of the Democratic Alliance? <laughs> That's a naughty question. The leader of the, free, uh, of the Democratic Alliance is Mr. John Steenhuisen. Um, that question was asked to me, and I'm also going to be a bit naughty. And I will say to, to John Steenhuisen, ensure that Helen Zilla stays in her lane. <laughs> because she said she will keep in her lane. So ensure that she keeps in her lane. So unfortunately, that interview ended prematurely because of load shedding and our inverted didn't kick in. I want to once again apologize to Dr. Grunewald. Um, we have been in contact. He says it's fine, but I want to apologize once again. And please, if you like this interview, share this widely as possible, like it and subscribe to our channel. After the load shedding, I've made myself calm. I'm rustig. Nothing can upset me anymore. Ach, nie fucking weer nie.